<laughs> hey guys, and welcome to the Cody Curling Calvet episode seven. Is this seven? I uh, I always love listening to the intro music because it makes me feel like I don't know, like I'm an actual broadcaster or something. It just like sets the tone. I did get a comment from a listener how uh, how the music doesn't fit. So if you guys aren't familiar with my vlog, like my video blog series on YouTube and Facebook, that's like my ending music. And it's got some overlay of all the different, uh, scenes that I pulled out. Some of my favorites from the first couple of seasons from the videos. And this person said that it doesn't work well, but it's like, it's my sound. It's like my signature sound. Like when my kids hear that sound, that music playing, they know that's associated with the videos. So I don't know. I know it's not perfect, but I love listening to it. Maybe I'll shorten it up. Maybe I'll take out like the the gas hole part. I feel like I'd have mutiny on my hands if, if the gas hole part isn't in there. If you guys also are only familiar with the podcasts and not the videos, the, uh, the gas hole part is iconic in two parts. One, Emerson, when he was little, would get into my literal truck gas hole. So there's a scene where I was telling him to get out of my gas hole. And then there's also like some context around the, the ruminotomy that I do. I guess it would be called a ruminostomy. Whatever. It, uh, it's basically a bloat surgery where you enter into the rumen. And it blows off all the gas and chronic bloaters. So I call that a gas hole as well. So yeah, we are back. We survived camping. In the last podcast, I had mentioned that we were going on a backcountry camp trip. And it was fantastic. We were out there for three days, two nights on our way out. So it was a four kilometer hike in which isn't crazy, but that's a long ways for a two-year-old and a four-year-old to go. And on the way in, it was storming like crazy, like lightning and thunder. And yeah, there was a few times we we were questioning our, our sanity going in there. Just a spectacular sight. So if you guys aren't familiar with like the the Rockies close to where we are, the Rocky Mountains. Uh, it's fairly close to Banff in an area called Kananaskis, and the specific place was between the upper and lower Kananaskis lakes. So we literally just parked our car, put on two big backpacks, and hiked in with the kids four kilometers and the dog, and set up camp in the rain and had some supper, stayed overnight, and then we just putzed around. <laughs> There was almost nobody in the whole area. We saw two people all day. And we hiked to some falls and kind of scared ourselves because we saw some bear poop. And uh, it was just fantastic. Then after that next second night, it had rained all night. And we just got up in the morning. It was pouring out, just drenched from head to toe. And we headed out back onto the trail and made it back to our car by I think like 10 o'clock and drove through this phenomenal uh, mountain field uh, because it was pouring so much and there was still snow melting. The rivers were just like raging in this torrential rage. It, it was a, yeah, it was a pretty phenomenal trip. It's very wet, not too cold, lots of mosquitoes and just seeing some fantastic stuff that I don't know, you just, you wouldn't get to see without walking into the the backcountry. And I'm not trying to be like one of those pretentious, because I know people are like, oh, I climbed a mountain. Oh, I'm a backcountry camper. I only do backcountry ski. I don't want to be like that, but it, the trip was phenomenal. So we have another camping trip planned as a family coming up in a few days. Uh, after the, after our camping trip now, I took a few days off, so I think a little family staycation for a few days after the trip. We went out and did some 
tubing behind a boat at a friend's place who has a lake on their property. Another phenomenal sight, like this lake and then all these cows around and we're the only ones on the lake. And then we went to the Calgary Zoo and just had some fun family time. So yeah, camping coming up in a couple of days. So today's episode is going to be a little more medicine-based. I have so many comments from you guys. I have this treasure trove of things that I need to talk about on this podcast now. So many different requests. Uh, this one's going to be medical in nature. Uh, I feel like I've, there's no set like topic for this for this podcast series. It's just kind of things that I want to talk about. And it's going to be a mix of like veterinary culture and politics and uh, business stuff and also medicine and things that I see and things that's, that's going on and things that people just want more context and questions about my life as a beef cattle veterinarian. So I, I feel like I haven't really rounded out the, the gambit of what, uh, you know, what I should be fulfilling from the medical side. I feel like there's like, I don't know. I don't know why he's Russian, an imaginary Russian listener thinking that's yelling into his phone saying, why does he never talk about medicine? Dance, Galvet, dance. Give me more medicine. I do not want to listen to you talk about culture of veterinary medicine dance and give me more medicine okay if you guys comment back uh like send me an email saying you never want another accent again i'll be fine with that you just have to let me know i i've got thick skin i can take it so this one is going to be just based off of a phone call that i got today from a producer who was having some issues with pink eye so pink eye Unlike the the bout of pink eye that went through my house uh, several months ago when both of the kids got pink eye uh, that's uh, comedically known uh, to be caused by farting on somebody else's pillow. As far as I know, nobody's pillow got (laughs) farted on or sharded on. But uh, in human medicine, pink eye is typically a uh, viral in origin Although there can be some some bacterial causes for sure. In cows, it's almost always bacterial in origin and a specific species of bacteria called Morxella bovis. So the fancy name, am I going to remember the fancy name? The fancy name of pink eye is infectious keratoconjunctivitis. Conjunctivitis. Yeah, see, I didn't even get it right. Infectious bovine... Corrado, I don't even think bovine's in there. Corrado conjunctivitis, I swear I'm a vet. It's really late. Anyways, what that means is uh, a few different parts of the eye is infected. So the conjunctiva is infected, and then also the the keratin layer of the eye, basically the, the cornea is infected with this uh, nasty bacterial infection. So the Typical or hallmark signs of that are blepharospasm. So that would be like this, like eye twitching um, movement because that that eye is really really painful, and also um, they're they're photophobic, so they're sensitive to light, and they have excessive lacrimation, so they're also tearing up quite a bit. So when you see a cow that is has you know a red eye potentially a white spot on that eye depending on how much corneal edema there is but but the real i guess tells of whether or not that animal is still infected with that uh pink eye is is that eye twitching that sensitivity to light and also that excessive lacrimation that excessive tearing so basically what happens in terms of the pathogenesis is one animal, for whatever reason, is going to start getting a drippy eye. So they could have caught it on something, some grass, some uh, barbed wire, another cow whipped it in the eye with its tail. It's going to get some corneal damage and start the, the primary infection of the Morixella bovis bacteria. From there, uh, the bacteria proliferates, and that can be the start of a herd outbreak. So once there is a lot of bacteria 
being produced at that local site and a lot of tearing, then the face fly, the common face fly, is then going to land in all of that tears because that's good food and good water. And it's going to get it all over its little feet and all over its little proboscis, <laughs> like its, its nose mouthpiece. And then it's going to fly to the next uh, cow and it's going to transmit that bacteria over and over again. So that is going to be, you know, the typical transmission. And once it starts in a herd, it can be really difficult to control. We'll see outbreak situations uh, year over year. We'll see, you know, very pasture dependent situations. So, you know, there's, there's lots of causative factors as to why it happens. Uh, whether it's, it's the grass is hitting the cow in the eye and it's just like the perfect length, uh, the grass is maturing and it's not being grazed down as quickly, uh, dry, dusty conditions, all of those types of things can certainly predispose those animals to getting pink eye. So today I got a call from the producer who said that he's, he's noticing more pink eye than he's used to and he wanted to know if he could use a different antibiotic. So the antibiotic he was using was a tetracycline. Perfect. Uh, based on the the literature, uh, tetracyclines is the antibiotic choice for treating a typical uh, more bovis infection. It has the highest concentration of antibiotic in the in the tears, so it seems like it's probably a pretty good fit. Uh, the bacteria itself is fairly wimpy. It does seem to respond to quite a few broad spectrum antibiotics, but just based off of the science, it probably looks like tetracyclines is the best. So he was getting a non-response to treatment and wanted to know what else and uh, immediately asked if he should be using a, a macrolide uh, in specifically uh, Mycotil as should he be switching antibiotics. So we had to stop and take a breath and not talk about antibiotics, but talk about all of the other things things that we could potentially be doing first and foremost before we started reaching for different antibiotics or antibiotics at all. You know, we're, we're treating the herd, not the individual. And, it, you know, it, from an economic standpoint, pink eye can be very significant uh, depending on whether we're talking about an outbreak in a feedlot situation or on, on the uh, cow-calf ranch situation. Usually the number that gets thrown around is between $20 and $30. Uh, so in terms terms of production loss. So for every animal that gets pink eye, you could potentially be losing 20 to $30. That's a significant amount of money in an outbreak situation. So we had to back things up and, and talk about what are some other things we could do to prevent pink eye in the first place. So talking about, you know, are those animals in the best possible uh, state to protect themselves from getting natural pink eye infections? Uh, the first question I asked was a mineral program. Are those cows on a mineral program? Uh, the answer was no, which is, well, it's not fine. My preference would be they're on a mineral program. And the reason that I asked that is that cows that are not deficient on their micronutrients, so like vitamin A, vitamin E, zinc, copper, uh, kind of the normal immune system uh, micronutrients that are needed, both for local immunity of good eye health, but also good systemic immunity as well. If we're lacking in any one of those, we can make the herd certainly susceptible to uh more pink eye infections than would be typical. So in this case, it wasn't. And the other reason that I had asked if they were on mineral is when cows are used to eating mineral, it also allows us to kind of do a couple different tricks in the mineral itself. So the first trick would be garlic. Now the science behind garlic, there is some paper showing that it could potentially work as a fly deterrent. Remember, we're talking about flies in the uh, pathogenesis of pink eye and how it gets uh, transmitted. So if we can tr control the flies, uh, maybe we can control the disease spread, this contagious disease spread. And garlic in mineral, in some cases, does appear to decrease the number of of face flies and perhaps decrease the total amount of uh, pink eye that could happen in an outbreak situation. The 
other thing that we were uh, discussing was in a really, really severe, and I don't make this recommendation very often, but in a really severe outbreak situation out on pasture, sometimes I'll make a recommendation to prescribe uh, an overall herd treatment with a tetracycline in the mineral. So uh, at a low dose uh, of, of usually chlortetracycline in the mineral for a pulse, usually around 10 days, can oftentimes stop a pink eye outbreak dead in its tracks. Now, it is using antimicrobials as a preventative and not as a treatment, but in some cases we do have to do that. Uh, It's one of the tools we have in our arsenal as veterinarians and cattle producers that when we think that it is justified, we can use antimicrobials as a preventative. Uh, so, so that was another reason that I asked if those cows were used to eating mineral, then we had another tool within our toolbox to help prevent this problem. Uh, I continued down the, the questioning path of fly control. So what are we doing about fly control? Do we have natural resistance? Do we have uh, fly tags? Do we have the ability to put out cattle oilers? Uh, Is there anything we can do from a pasture management standpoint to help control flies? Is there anything we can do from poron uh, insecticide standpoint to help control flies? Anything we can do to help control flies can certainly help control the the overall problem. Uh, In this case, the cows did have fly tags, so uh, pyrethroid-based fly tags uh, that would keep, uh, like, I, I like them. Fly tags work pretty good. Sometimes they can be a little bit of an expense, and they certainly don't last forever. So, like, around that four to um, six weeks would be pretty typical. Uh, so that was good, using using that fly control uh we could get them on mineral so that gave us an option and then the next thing we were talking about is vaccines so not in a pasture situation would we consider vaccinating uh, because we just can't run those cattle in off the pasture and vaccinate there is several commercial vaccines available for the prevention of pink eye uh, I'm not a huge proponent of that. It's not something that I would regularly recommend unless we were having um, year-over-year outbreak situations in a specific herd and we knew we had significant economic loss. If it's just kind of baseline pink eye levels and it's never really been a problem, then it's pretty hard to justify the cost. Uh, and efficacy is let's just say it's not the best vaccine in the world but it's certainly not the worst vaccine in the world either it's just not something that i reach for very often although i do have several producers on it every year because they have had issues in the past and anecdotally they do think that it does help so that's good we we have no problem with making that recommendation if uh if we need to And then we started talking about true treatment options. So preventative was one thing, but the producer was asking, what else can we do for treatment options? Like I said, he was using a tetracycline um, one time, a long-acting tetracycline one time. So the initial recommendation was maybe we should just try to retreat those animals and also some education around what animals that would even potentially respond to antibiotics. As I mentioned before, uh, animals that have active infections are tearing up uh, quite a bit, and they also have that eye spasm from that pain. Uh, Animals that are past the active infection stage that will still have that corneal ulcer, that scarring, um, that uh, corneal edema, so that kind of clouded eye, if they're not actively tearing up and actively having that eye spasm, then there is no active infection going on and throwing antibiotics at them is not going to treat that that eye pathology any further. Um, we're just going to have to let the cards sit where they lay and hopefully uh, there's some reorganizing of that corneal tissue in the future and they'll be able to see a little bit better. So making sure that you're treating those animals uh, appropriately. So only treating the ones that have active infections is certainly the, the prudent uh, route to go. 
from a individual animal medicine standpoint. Now, my recommendation in a non-responsive uh, pink eye that was still actively infected, so the producer treated with the tetracycline, and three days later there was still seemed to be little to no improvement, would actually be to just retreat again. It's not so much which antibiotic that we're picking, it's, uh, it's duration. Just like when we go to the human doctor, uh, very suddenly they're going to prescribe us an antibiotic that's that only lasts three days right usually it's going to be five days or 10 days or 15 days or 14 days or however how do those doctors pick those days i don't know i i was listening to this infectious disease podcast one time it's by dr mark chrislip uh his podcast is called gobbit opus it's a fantastic podcast uh, he's an infectious de- disease doctor in Portland, Oregon, and he takes care of, I think it was like five or seven hospitals in the infectious disease department, and he was talking about uh, the rationalizations behind antibiotic therapy uh, duration, and he said that usually doctors picked five days because there's five fingers on your hand. Uh, they typically would pick seven days because there were seven days in the week, uh, 10 was another favorite number because there's 10 fingers and 14 days was another very favorite number of among the human doctors for duration of antibiotic use, uh, because that was equivalent to exactly two weeks. So his point being that there's very little scientific rationalization behind duration of antibiotic usage and it's uh more more in line with how many fingers or days in the week there are than than true science so i found that always fascinating but in this case uh, when we're treating pink eye i i don't have a problem with retreating with the same antibiotic before we're reaching for the term bigger guns different antimicrobials altogether um I remember my pharma professor back in vet school talking about Morgzella bovis, uh, and I can hear her southern accent very clearly, uh, basically stating that it is a wimpy organism, that uh, nearly every antibiotic should be able to knock it out, and that simply waving a bottle of any antibiotic in front of a pink eye will essentially clear it up. Uh, if you're having a non-responsive treatment, it's typically because of the, the pathology that exists and not because there's resistance to the, the antibiotic that you've chosen. So in that case, you know, I'll, I'll typically make a recommendation to just prolong treatment with the same antibiotic as opposed to switch things up. If we were going to switch things up, I don't really have a good answer. I certainly want people to talk to their individual veterinarians to see what their recommendation is. Uh, there's, based on the science, there's not, there is really not a better option than a tetracycline. Uh, although I do know a lot of veterinarians that make recommendations for things like sulfa drugs, uh, macrolides like Draxin or Micotil would also be fairly common, ampicillin. There's a, a variety of different antimicrobials that could be recommended in that case. Uh, during treatment, I also like to recommend a non steroidal anti-inflammatory, uh, the active ingredient meloxicam being uh, one that is preferential in a pasture situation, I feel, because of the duration of, uh, of active ingredient in the animal lasting out to about three days. So I like the duration of effect from that regard. And... I also really like the kind of more treating the animal as opposed to, to treating the, the bacteria as well. I really like putting eye patches on, uh, decreasing the total amount of sunlight. I've seen some amazing uh, pictures on the internet. One of my favorites shared on my Facebook page, like on my uh, Palpation Nation community group, was of a, a bra that was modified uh, to be a, a spectacular cow eye patch. It worked perfectly. She just, I assume it was a she, uh, cut out one of the cups so the cow could see out of its good eye and uh, left the cup on for the bad eye. So yeah, I really like putting those patches on. I think it really 
it makes the animal more comfortable not being in the direct sunlight. It also decreases the amount of flies that are flying around. And, and I also feel like it probably also decreases the total amount of contamination uh, being spread because those flies aren't able to kind of land on that nasty infected tear and then go off and, uh, and land on the next face of the cow and infect that animal as well. So those are those are very good. Some lesser, I guess, scientifically proven treatments would be this eye injection technique. And it's there is research to show that the eye injection is good, but the problem is is it's often bastardized. Uh, so if you guys can imagine, um, so the, the conjunctiva of your eye is actually two parts. So you have your palpebral conjunctiva, which is like the pink stuff around your eye. Uh, like if you lifted up your eyelid and saw pink, that would be uh, your your palpebral conjunctiva. But then you also have your bulbar conjunctiva. So that's actually the conjunctiva that attaches to your eyeball. And the the technique of the of the conjunctival injection is to inject a few cc's of an antimicrobial microbial uh, into the conjunctiva so that it causes this kind of depot effect, this long-acting antibiotic effect by putting the antibiotic directly at the point source of, of where the infection is. But in the technique, it clearly describes the injection to be put in the ball bar conjunctiva. So actually underneath the the, the conjunctiva attached to the eyeball. So you would physically have to lift that cow's eyelid up and then inject, um, for lack of a better term, a, a subcutaneous injection right in the eyeball. So going in at an angle, leaving this bleb of antibiotic right there. Now, <laughs> that technique is being so bastardized because people just see the word conjunctiva and they think that they know what they're talking about when when they go to inject the, the conjunctiva. So instead of putting it in the ball bar conjunctiva, they're putting in the palpebral conjunctiva, so the actual like pink, pink of your eye. Now, that's extremely vascular. And when you inject a couple of cc's of antimicrobial into the palpebral conjunctiva, the blood supply just picks it up and takes it away. There's no depot effect. So you're in effect underdosing uh, that animal by <laughs> several orders of magnitude because now it's just got a, you might as well have given that antibiotic in its neck. So that technique can work. I've certainly seen, well, like I was a pen rider before I was a feedlot vet before I got into vet school. Uh, that was my job. And the the way that we treated pink eye at the feedlot that I worked at was a couple cc's of white penicillin in the in the ball bar conjunctiva. No, sorry, in the palpebral conjunctiva, so the pink of the eye, uh, with about half a cc of dexamethasone. So we put it in the wrong spot, way underdose anti <laughs> antibiotic, but then we also put a mastitis cream in the eye as well, and then we also sprayed it with a purple spray. So we did three things to treat pink eye, and they responded. So it worked, but just because it works doesn't mean we necessarily should always be doing it. And in this case, it just doesn't work. And I've even seen it, like when we're talking about the, the two cc's of, of penicillin in the palpebral conjunctiva. It's just not an appropriate use of antibiotics. But I've even then seen it carried further to to veterinarians recommending things like Mycotil, things like Draxin, things like Nuflor, things like Resflor to, to go up that next spot, but then there that next step uh, in terms of important antibiotics and then put it directly in the eye again. So two cc's of Resflor in the eye. And I just cringe. And then the, the next kind of bastardization that I've seen is instead of taking that time to put it in the, even in the, the bulbar conjunctiva or the palpebral conjunctiva, they'll actually just inject it like over top of the cow's eyelid through the skin. It just, it gets out of control and messy. And... <sighs> We just shouldn't be doing things like that.
Now the special formula, like the the mastitis cream, there is some research out there and some recommendations to use a, a topical uh, antibiotic slash anti-inflammatory. You have to be really careful with the steroids that are in those. Uh, depending on how deep that ulcer is, you can make that ulcer worse by inhibiting that uh, corneal uh, rejuvenation, that, that healing process by adding steroids into the eye. Not a, not an ideal situation. So be extremely careful when at putting anything into the eye and also, just as like a general thing, uh, once again, I've heard of every sort of, not horror story, but things that you probably shouldn't be doing uh, for treating stuff like pink eye, but like putting stuff like used motor oil into a cow's eyes, uh, transmission oil, just stuff like that. And yeah, we just shouldn't be putting nasty things into cow's eyes. So broad spectrum antibiotics, anti-inflammatories, put a patch on, use fly control, make sure the herd's on a good mineral package and uh, good nutrition, and we should be okay. We should be able to deal with this and to treat this without, without too much issue. Outbreak situations are very, very frustrating. Always talk to your veterinarian about uh, different prevention and treatment options. Every situation is always going to be different. Um, I feel like in our practice, we can usually get a handle on the majority of cases. Uh, but it's always good to, to investigate. Like if, if there is a situation where it's not responding normally. Uh, we've a, a lot of times taken swabs looking for resistance. So swabbing new active infections before treatment, seeing what the resistance pattern is, seeing if we're not able to grow different things uh, and making sure we have an accurate diagnosis. There's other diseases that can present similarly to pink eye, uh, stuff like uh, IBR infections where they'll get a conjunctivitis as well. Um, mycoplasma uh, at times can also cause a, a conjunctivitis. And then there's been other bacteria that have been isolated from the eye as well. Whether or not they're significant or primary pathogens, uh, the debate is still out there. But yeah, talking to your vet and working cases up and, and getting a firm answer for your specific herd is always the certainly the best recommendation. And hopefully that... You know, my rant has just provided a little bit of clarity. Uh, there's some great, spectacular resources online, just essentially Googling pink eye cow. Uh, and Merck is a good resource, uh, M-E-R-C-K. I can't spell this late at night. That's got to be right for sure. <laughs> That's like the easiest word. I'm, I am a really questioning myself there so many great articles in different cattlemen magazines lots of uh, u.s vet school and agriculture uh, extension white papers on pink eye tons of information out there uh, i would just suggest to stay away from the cattle boards like the the like discussion groups and stuff like that there can be good suggestions at times but that's where you get into the in inject two cc's draxin up there and we'll have you'll have no problem at all you'll clear it up every single time there we go with the accents again i'm sorry if i offended anybody from the south like southern alberta no the deep south okay that's it for the podcast i would appreciate an honest review on any of the podcast sites that you guys are using this uh, podcast has been a phenomenal phenomenal journey so far and i would just love to keep up the momentum if you guys uh want to check out any of my other stuff just google cody creelman cow vet you'll see me on youtube my facebook page my instagram my twitter but whatever you would like, you will see it. You can kind of keep keep up with my goings on and uh, check out some of my vlogs. If you haven't seen it, I upload this podcast to the YouTubes and Facebook as well. And yeah, if you have any questions or comments, just email me at Cody, not at Cody, Cody at Cody dot com. OK, guys, thank you so much. See you next time.